so um, I was unable to go live right at one o'clock but here I am it is another week and another week's worth of reading lessons for you so I hope you had a good weekend I know um, this morning I have been working here at my house quite a bit on um, e-learning stuff and trying to get things to work on my Chromebook and I'm starting to get kind of frustrated but that's what happens <laughs> sometimes so no big deal I'm going to keep working my hair's doing kind of a little wonky thing right now um, I'm going to keep working and um, try my best and we'll see how this goes so it's a new learning experience for everybody I know that um, today's lesson we are going to work again on some nonfiction. Uh, make sure that we are studying and reviewing in the best way that we can every day. But today's lesson is going to focus on this. It's called framed writing. And framed writing is another way for boys and girls to make sure that they are um, getting all the information that they need out of text. So about the side-by-side um, -side note taking that you can do. This is another way that you can review nonfiction work and make sure that you are getting everything that you need out of it and that you are comprehending it as well as you need to. So, um, I am ready to get started, and being here in this area, um, in the Louisville, Kentucky area where I live, if you are not from this area, um, that's, um, there is something that is very important to us here, and that is horse racing. And normally, we would be coming into the time where we would be doing the Kentucky Derby Festival because Derby is always the first Saturday in May. So this year, it was supposed to be on May 3rd, I believe. That was the date. Well, because of the coronavirus pandemic, it has been moved back. And instead of it being a spring event, it's now going to be a late summer event. So um, we are hoping to have it on Saturday, September 5th this year. And this is going to be really, really weird for those of us that live here to um to have it at that time of the year because it's something that we're not used to at all. But Today, I am going to share with you one of the um, small or short nonfiction pieces in this book that I have. It's called Tales of Famous Animals by Peter and Connie. Is it say Roop? Yep, it, illustrated by Zachary Pullen. So, um, in this text, one of the short nonfiction pieces is about a horse that was very, very famous in his time. In fact, there has been a movie made about him and um, also a book. And I actually read the book um, a few years ago, and it's about a horse named Seabiscuit. And Seabiscuit passed away many, many, many years ago. But that a lot of people a racehorse that a lot of people did not think he was going to do much at all. They didn't think that he was going to be very successful at all. And he ended up proving them wrong um, by working with a the group of humans that he trained and worked with. So um, to start with, it says, the starting bell rang, 13 horses surged out of the gate, and they're off, called the racetrack announcer. The world's race with the biggest prize was on. So I'm going to read, and we can read to find out what happened with Seabiscuit. The horses thundered in the track. Here comes Seabiscuit, someone shouted. Here comes the biscuit, here comes the biscuit, roared that. 
California's Santa Anita Racetrack. So a lot of horses are from the Kentucky area around here, but Seabiscuit wasn't. He was from California. Seabiscuit's hooves pounded the ground. Red Pollard, Bis Biscuit's jockey, urged the short brown horse to pu put his big heart into the race. Seabiscuit sprinted to the finish line to win. Seabiscuit had at least twice. But today, March 2nd, 1940, was Seabiscuit's day. The crowd roared for their hero, Seabiscuit, America's Wonder Horse. When Seabiscuit was born in Kentucky, so okay, he was born here, but then he was racing out in California. On May 23rd of 1933, he did not act like a champion racehorse. He was small, his legs were thin. He wobbled like a duck when he ran. Seabiscuit would bite or kick anyone who came near him. Seabiscuit, however, had the blood of racing champions. Man of War, his grandfather, was one of the United States' best thoroughbred racing horses. Hard Tack, his father, was a champion too. Seabiscuit raced 18 times before he finally won. In 1935, when Seabiscuit was just two years old, he raced 35 times. Few colts ran that many races in one year. Seabiscuit had the talent to win, but he was lazy. Seabiscuit's owners decided to sell him, but no one wanted the bad-mannered colt. One day, Tom Smith, a talented horse trainer, watched Seabiscuit. In front view all around, he kind of said, after the race, he nodded at Seabiscuit. Darned if the little rascal didn't nod back, he said. He whispered to Seabiscuit, I'll see you again. Smith spoke to Charles Howard, his boss, and said, give me that horse. He has the real stuff in him. I can improve it. I'm positive. Howard and his wife, Marcella, bought Seabiscuit for $8,000 in August of 1936. S Smith was the skilled, caring trainer Seabiscuit needed to make him a winner. Seabiscuit now had owners who saw his racing potential. But what jockey could win while riding cantankerous Seabiscuit? Cantankerous means kind of moody, mean. Small, fiery-tempered Red Pop Pollard proved to be that jockey. In 1936, Pollard, like millions of Americans, was down on his luck. He had few riding jobs. But he was in the middle of the Great Depression. Millions of people had lost their jobs. Many had lost their homes. Americans needed a hero to take their minds off the Depression's bad times. Bad-tempered, lazy Seabiscuit would become that national hero. Smith made Seabiscuit feel at home in his stable. A wall of his stall was knocked down to give him more room. Smith thought Seabiscuit needed animal companions to calm him down. So he put a goat in Seabiscuit's stall. Seabiscuit tossed the goat out. Smith put a pony named Pumpkin in with Seabiscuit. Seabiscuit and Pumpkin quickly became friends. A dog named Pocketel and a monkey named Jojo also joined him. Smith worked hard to earn Seabiscuit's trust. He talked to him. He let him sleep late. He fed him a special diet. He rubbed Seabiscuit's knobby legs. Smith said, we had to rebuild him both mentally and physically, but you don't have to rebuild the heart when it's already there, big as all outdoors. Seabiscuit Sea became better behaved. And with Pollard aboard, Seabiscuit ran faster and faster. Howard and Smith decided it was time for Seabiscuit to enter a race. California Santa Anita Handicap. The winner won $100,000. That, that's a lot of money today, but think about how much that was back in the 1930s. That would be more like a million dollars back then. The race was on March 6, 1937. The race was and the horses. Seabiscuit was in fourth place, then third, then second, then first. But another horse named Rosemont caught up with Seabiscuit. Seabiscuit and Rosemont raced across the finish line. Rosemont by a nose. The Seabiscuit team was not discouraged. They believed Seabiscuit could be a champion. They were right. Seabiscuit won races and broke records. The knobby need horse was becoming an American favorite. Seabiscuit, however, was not the United States' best horse. War Admiral Seabiscuit's uncle won all his races in 1937 and was named the Horse of the Year. 1938 was Seabiscuit's year. He lost another close race at Santa, Ana, uh, Santa Anita, but then he hit his stride. He won race after race. Fans across the country kept up with Seabiscuit's career. 
Seabiscuit came in first in newspaper reports in 1938, surpassing both President Franklin Roosevelt and German leader Adolf Hitler. Seabiscuit was named Horse of the Year. Then tragedy struck. On June 23, 1938, Seabiscuit's favorite rider, Red Pollard, was seriously injured while riding another horse. A different jockey rode Seabiscuit in the race of the century on November 1, 1938. War Admiral and Seabiscuit shot out of the gates when the starting bell rang. Seabiscuit quickly took the lead. Suddenly, War Admiral raced up to him. Would this another heartbreaking loss for Seabiscuit? No! Seabiscuit pulled away from War Admiral and thundered to the finish line. Seabiscuit was now the champion of champions. In a race in early 1939, Seabiscuit badly hurt his left leg during a race. People thought neither he nor Pollard would ever race again. But Seabiscuit showed his true spirit. Smith slowly got Seabiscuit's injured leg healthy. Pollard shared Seabiscuit's same determination and got his own leg healthy too. By 1940, Seabiscuit and Red Pollard were ready to race again. The Seabiscuit team believed they could win a handicap, the same race they had lost twice before, and they did. Pollard said, the greatest ride I ever got from the greatest horse that ever lived. After this race, Seabiscuit retired to the Howard's Ranch, where he lived at until his death on May 17, 1947. In 1941, a life-size statue of Seabiscuit was at Santa Anita race. So Santa Anita in California kind of became his home, his home track. The inscription of the statue reads, Biscuit's courage, honesty, and physical definitely place him among the thoroughbred immortals of turf history. He had intelligence and understanding, almost spiritual in quality. Long after Seabiscuit's heroic last race, people still remember the determination and courage of America's wonder horse. So, there is a cartoon picture of the statue that is located at Santa Anita Racetrack in California. Now, since we have read that, I am going to leave it off to the side because I have told you that you have to make sure that you keep whatever text it is, especially if it's a nonfiction text and you need to take notes and you need to remember what it is that you're reading, um, close to you so that you can always go back and read for additional information. That is so important. It's what good readers do. They always reread and check themselves. You've seen me do that already on these lessons, right? So I want you to focus on that and do that too. Now, um, framed writing. So there are lots of ways that you can do this. There are lots of beginning prompts for, um, or sentence starters that you can use for um, your text. And I'm going to model one for you right now. So if you don't have paper and pencil, I would strongly suggest that you go ahead and get that so that you can jot down um, your work here when I will have it on my board. And... when I will have it here on my board, and that way you can use it as notes besides going back and re-watching this video if you need to. Um, so, obviously, it is our title of our text is going to be about sea biscuit. So I'm gonna write that here at the top. So Sea Biscuit is our title. So now, um, the starters that I'm going to use, I learned in college. It, they are the ones that I usually use with the boys and girls um, in my class. So I, um, but again, there are other ones that you could use. You could use it if you are comparing and contrasting. You could use it with um, the you know, a, some supporting details, and then at the end, list the main idea. But um, I am just going to do this based on reviewing a text with you, okay? So, um, the first sentence starter that I learned in college that I always keep right next to me goes like this. I learned some new 
things. blank. And what I'm going to put in that blank is again my topic. So I learned some new things about, I'm going to say it's Seabiscuit, but who is Seabiscuit? Seabiscuit was a famous racehorse. About Seabiscuit, comma, the famous racehorse. Okay, so that tells you what my topic is that I am um, going to be writing and make sure that I am helping myself to understand and remember. Next part. For instance, For instance, now I need to give a bit of nonfiction fact. So something new that I learned about Seabiscuit. So for instance, I can say Seabiscuit was named Horse of the Year in 1938. And I'm going to um, capitalize and then year because it's an official name of an award and it's a very big award. It's the biggest award really a horse can get um, with his team or her team. Yeah, can be a female too. For instance, Seabiscuit was horse of the year in 1938. And I'm going to underline that. Okay. And then I'm going to write down another bit of information. I also learned, and this is where I find another bit of information that I think is very important. So I work really hard with boys and girls in my class, making sure that they don't, um, just write down information that's not really important. You want to focus on things that could be potentially maybe test worthy or um, things that probably you need to you need to put in here as part of your prior knowledge. So um, I also learned that Sea Biscuit. Um, let's see, badly, well, he did hurt his left leg, badly hurt his left leg in 1939, but got better. down a bit. So I'm going to underline that fact that I put in. And then this is probably the most important part of reviewing your text because this sentence says, but the most important thing and I would say the most important thing that Seabiscuit is remembered for is that very famous one-on-one -on -one race that he did whenever he raced his very famous uncle in the race of the century in War Admiral. And he ended up beating War Admiral. So, but the most important thing is he beat War Admiral 
in, oops, not is, but in, and I'm going to put quotation marks around this because it's, an, it's the official name of the race, in the race of the century. I'm going to underline there is the fact. So sometimes when I work on this with boys and girls, they will often think of something that is probably not a very important event. So what I always tell people is look at your text. Obviously go back and figure out what what is this horse most known for? This horse would be most known for this famous race, the race of the century that he won. So this would be the most important thing in the text that I just read. And now, you remember how we um, have also focused on taking our text and going beyond it? That's something that I'm going to have you do right now because the ending paragraph is one question, or the ending sentence for this paragraph is one question I still have is. And this could be anything. One question I still have about Seabiscuit. One question I have, how much money did he totally win? One question I still have is, how much money did Seabiscuit win in all. So that allows me to think beyond the text and to go back and um, or to to research and figure out something other than we just. So um, this is free writing. As you can see, it took us only a couple minutes to do. First sentence, I just listed what, it, what the topic was. The next two sentences, I wrote an important fact. The third sentence is the most important detail. What is it that we really have to remember about this text? And then the last sentence is, what's a question you still have? So that is all for today. Um, I will see you again tomorrow. My challenge for you, I would love for you to go back. Um, if you want to do your own framed writing using this text, you can. If not, use another nonfiction piece that you have at home. Practice. The more that you practice, the better reader you will become. I promise you that. So, um, until tomorrow... I am going to say to little poodles, goodbye.